threes can be tricky. My sister and her husband have three boys, and I remember welcoming each one of them in turn. And the atmosphere was a little bit different each time. The firstborn, the first grandchild of that whole generation, was a marvel. He was like a little king. As we prepared for the second, I remember we had to help him get used to the idea of having a new little person around. But soon, everyone settled into their roles of big brother and little brother. But then, a few years later, the advent of the third brought a whole new dynamic. I remember when the youngest came home from the hospital, and his brothers by that time were six and four. And as aunt, I made sure to spend lots of quality time with both of the older boys. One night at the dinner table, the eldest was sitting on my lap, eating my chocolate cake with my fork, and he said, you know who's number one on my list? I said, what list? He said, my list of favorite people. I thought I had a pretty good shot in that moment, so I asked, who? And he said, daddy. And I said, oh, well, what number am I? And he said, you're number two. His mother, I'd better be on that list. And he said, well, you're number three. And his grandmother said, what about me? He said quickly, six. Then he went on to list everyone around the table in order of his favorites, declaring his middle brother to be his least favorite. Now, as a fellow middle child and as his godmother, I saw a teachable moment. So I suggested that maybe it wasn't a very good idea to announce his favorites out loud because it might hurt somebody's feelings if they didn't place at the top of the list. So I tried to suggest another way of naming favorites. And to each of the little ones, I assigned a title of favorite. To the middle one, I said, you are my favorite nephew who is four. And he thought about it for a minute and he said, I'm your only nephew that's four. To the eldest, I said, you are my favorite godson. He said, I'm your only godson. To their girl cousin, I said, and you are my favorite niece. And she said, I'm your only niece. They were vaguely dissatisfied with this sort of equal favoritism. But nonetheless, they seemed to catch on to the idea that each could be celebrated for some unique quality without displacing the others. Today is Trinity Sunday. Now, thinking about the Trinity can be complicated. It raises all sorts of tough questions. Who was there first? Who made who? Who has the most power? Did the Father send the Son and the Spirit, or did the Father and the Son send the Spirit? The theological battles of the first few centuries of the church show us that maybe it's neither nice nor helpful to think of the Trinity in terms of who's your favorite person. There was Arius, in the fourth century, who thought that Jesus couldn't have been both divine and human. Arius and his followers favored God the Father over Jesus. So in response, the Council of Nicaea met in 325 to establish that Jesus, the Son of God, is not less than God, but rather of one substance, of one being with the Father. We say that in the Creed. Then there were those who, who denied the divinity of the Holy Spirit. And in response, the Cappadocian fathers developed this language of three co-equal, co-eternal persons sharing one divine being, no favorites among them, just an ongoing mutual relationship, each remaining distinct while giving and receiving. It's sort of hard to imagine how controversial this all was at the time. Today, when we recite in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we may find these comforting, 
deeply familiar words, maybe some of the first words of prayer we ever learned. Or we might wonder, what does that even mean? When we talk about the Trinity, it's important to remember that words have power and words have limits. On the one hand, the power of words about the Trinity rests in helping us to imagine an ever-moving relational God that can't be reduced to any one particular notion. And yet, if we stop and think about these words, we must acknowledge that they are analogical. After all, if we were to take them literally, it would mean that our image of God is limited to two men and a bird. Now, finding the right words for God, it's complicated. The way we speak about God is of utmost importance. The words and images we use for God represent what we hold to be the greatest good, the deepest truth, and how we see and treat one another in community. It makes me appreciate how in the Jewish tradition, the name of God is not to be spoken or written because speaking it or writing it runs the risk of corrupting it. Similarly, in Islamic tradition, there is a litany of the 99 names of Allah and the hundredth name, which is believed to be the true name, is honored in silence as it does not exist. Scripture tells us of a God who is constantly revealing God's self in new and surprising ways. In the very first verses of the whole Bible, the first verses of Genesis, chapter 1, we hear, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And in just that snapshot, we hear that God is creator, word, and spirit. And in today's passage, we hear the last few words of Matthew's gospel, when Jesus tells the disciples to go out and baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In 2 Corinthians, we hear what has become a familiar apostolic greeting. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. In this, we hear the efforts of the early church to describe their multifaceted experience of God, the transcendent God far beyond their knowing, the flesh and blood experience of Jesus right with them, and the stirring of the Spirit among them. It also gives us a hint that each being, each person of the Trinity, reveals an aspect of God's gift and favor. From the Creator, love. From Jesus, grace. From the Spirit, communion. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus' own language about God was vivid and imaginative. He spins image after image in his parables, a woman searching for a lost coin, a shepherd looking for sheep, a woman kneading dough, the wind that blows where it wills. And of himself, Jesus said, I am the light, I am the gate, I am the way and the truth and the life. And both the Old and New Testaments are filled with names that reveal some aspect of God's creation. Rock of salvation, tree of life, bread from heaven. Thinking about the Trinity invites us to think about how we see God. We all have our favorite ways of thinking about God and names for God that speak directly to our experience. And these favorite images of God may be the ones that run deepest through our veins, the ones we return to again and again. And we may get uncomfortable if someone tinkers with our familiar language. And yet, the gift of worshiping together in community 
is the ability to share from our own experiences, not to threaten or to replace, but rather to augment and expand one another's understanding of God. Some years ago in Italy, I heard Rowan Williams, then Archbishop of Canterbury, speak to an international gathering for L'Arche. And he said when he thinks of L'Arche, communities where people with and without disabilities share life together, when he thinks of L'Arche, he thinks of faces, faces of all kinds, faces with distinctive marks of disability, faces carrying suffering, joy, transparency, each one revealing something of the face of God. I remember in particular one line from his talk, tell me how you see people and I'll tell you how you see God. That has stuck with me. Tell me how you see people and I'll tell you how you see God. Think about it. If we expect and require people to look or to act in one way, it follows that we will see God that way too. And we will find it unsettling when someone suggests that God might look another way. If, however, we look at people in all our diversity with appreciation and wonder, there is room for us to be surprised and delighted by our God who is endlessly generous and creative in finding new ways to pour love into the world. Tell me how you see people, and I'll tell you how you see God. I believe that this is our call as church, to be a loving community that reveals a God of community. If we look around us right now, we see people who are younger and older and in between, people of different ethnicities, life experiences, diverse ways of expressing who we are, each of us revealing a distinct aspect of God's belovedness. We are each uniquely gifted and favored by God. When we hold one another in mutual respect, concern, and generosity, our beloved community becomes a mirror of God's own beloved community, the one we call the Trinity. May we know the blessing of God who has created us in all favor, of Jesus who came to dwell among us, and of the Spirit who binds us together in love. Amen.